Today's episode is brought to you by us, the Locations Unknown podcast. If you enjoy listening to content we create and want to help the show, consider becoming a Patreon supporter of Locations Unknown. For as little as $1 a month, you'll get access to additional Patreon-only episodes, a free Locations Unknown bumper sticker available after three months of support, and access to our members-only Discord server. That's not all. From time to time, we also host live supporter-only Zoom calls where no topic is off-limits. We've already hosted two calls this year. Every dollar of support goes right back into the show uh, to buy better equipment and software to help us produce a better show. If you can't support the show financially but still want to help out, make sure to like us on all the major social media platforms uh, and share the show with all of your friends and family. Links to all of our social media accounts are listed in the show notes below. To become a Patreon member of Locations Unknown, go to patreon.com slash locations unknown. Thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a guy who's more satisfying to watch than the cartoon Ninja Turtles eating pizza, <laughs> Mike Van de Bogart. Uh, thanks, Joe, and thank you once again to everyone who's tuning in on uh, Thanksgiving Eve. Uh, Joe and I are recording this right before the holiday. Uh, some couple updates here. First, uh, we'll get to our new Patreon supporters. We have Anastasia Hamilton. Uh, Bozina Hagen, Jordan Haber, Robert Myers, and Cassidy Myers. Uh, thank you so much for supporting the show. Um, every dollar you guys contribute to the show goes back into you know new equipment. Joe and I are looking for some retail space to potentially build out a professional studio, so we can use every dollar uh, we can get. So we just uh, truly. Yeah, we'll um, be trying out. Uh, Mike Mike brought up some new live streaming software. We're going to be giving a shot, and hopefully in the next. One or two episodes from now, we're going to be trying some new things. So, absolutely. So, I'm going to jump into a couple of quick uh, updates here. Uh, first of all, uh, this is funny, and I, I, I just got to give you props to the uh, the trolling job. Uh, there's a gentleman. <laughs> there's a gentleman on uh, YouTube who every episode we release makes a comment about how it, it doesn't sound loud enough, <laughs> and uh, you know. So, my suggestion would be to just kind of turn the volume up a little bit. <laughs> um, it, it sounds fine to us, but uh, like in Spinal Tap, turn it to 11. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> bravo, good sir, on the trolling job. You've made us mention you now on the podcast because yeah. it's, it's so funny. Um, this it's, all <laughs> it's lit. Mike, Mike just read them all to me right, right before we start. It's literally every episode. Great episode, can't hear it. Great yeah. episode, can't hear it. Hey, you should turn it up. I brought in, I bought an aftermarket speaker and turn it up, can't hear it. Yeah, might I suggest that you, if he's if he's being truthful, he might have a hearing problem. <laughs> Maybe. Hold, on, hold on. I think you might have a hearing problem. <laughs> Get your ears checked. YouTube commenter. All right. That, I won't do that anymore. That's for just for him. Just for him. Sorry <laughs> to everyone else for yelling into the microphone. Yeah. Um, we are also recording, uh, just to give a shout out, uh, Joe's 15th wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah. I uh, just celebrated my first year wedding anniversary, <laughs> and we're the same age, so. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to catch up. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have to we have to record this one, then I got to get the hell out of here because it's <laughs> his anniversary. <laughs> so, um, also, I mentioned this in Patreon. Uh, in December, since this is our three-year anniversary for starting the podcast this December, we're going to be doing some giveaways every week uh, throughout the month of December. Haven't really finalized exactly on what we're giving away, but I one of the weeks we'll give away a missing 401 book. I know people like that. When we that did was that popular before. last time, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we'll be giving away some swag. We, I've got some new swag ideas that aren't on the, the store yet that we'll be giving away. So 
Um, that's coming up. Uh, there might be a, a slight pause in episodes in January and February. I'm expecting uh, my first child at the end of December, so <laughs> I probably won't be getting around. There'll be to... a slight pause, then you'll be looking to get out of there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There'll be an uptick. Yeah. So uh, don't be alarmed if we uh, go radio silent for a month or two in the start of the new year. But I'm going to try and get some special guests on. Maybe do some. Uh, we could do like kind of like when a, a host leaves the night show. We'll just have guest hosts. There come we go. On. Yeah. And hopefully none of them are better than you. Let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, as Joe mentioned, um, we are going to be starting live streaming these on YouTube and possibly Facebook in the next, I don't know, two episodes. Uh, so stay tuned for that. That should be kind of fun to try out. Probably you'll have a lot of technical problems the first time we try it. <laughs> um, Usually we do. Yeah. And then um, I just wanted to ask Joe, in, you, any any comments or reactions to our last episode since it was kind of out of the ordinary and uh, kind of a touchy subject when you, you comment on something so recent? Um, That's active as far as I'm concerned? Yeah. I will say that we have I have filed... Um, request to try and get police reports from the Tacoma Police Department. Uh, so have not heard back from them yet. So if we hear anything, we'll, you know, we'll probably do another episode on it. So yeah, and I do want to mention too, um, because I don't know if it was clear, some people are asking how we knew certain things. And uh, Andy, who was the attorney who was on the show has a direct connection with people who are it sounds kind of like twice removed, but are he's good friends with people who are directly connected to this family who showed their concern. So that's where a lot of it came from of uh, friends of that family had concerns. And that's where we, so we, we have, you know, secondhand information, but it's from a guy who's direct friends. And it's simply because some of them did not want to come on the air to talk. So we talked potentially having them do an interview of anonymity where we'll mask the voice, but there's, there's some future updates that'll be coming from that episode. Yeah. And there was some additional information that we didn't talk about on the podcast out of a request by the, the people that contacted Andy. So that's why we're, we're trying to, you know, get them to come on so we can share more information on that. So stay tuned for that. And finally, this episode I wanted to do um, partly, you know, it took place in Grand Canyon and I had recently just posted something on our Patreon page about my uh, first backcountry hike in Canyonlands where our group ran out of water and uh, I thought this would be an interesting episode to kind of pair with that post. And if you're not a Patreon member, you can sign up for a dollar and go read it. There's lots of pictures too. Yeah, so. it's, it's a great story. You should really <laughs> sign up and listen. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's all I had, Joe. All right, without further ado, let's get up and get out to explore locations unknown. June 17th, 2016. Floyd, his best friend, and his daughter set out on a nine day backcountry hike on the northern edge of the Grand Canyon. Late that day, the group briefly split up for no more than 30 minutes to navigate around a small hill before reaching the trailhead to start their hike. When his friends got to the other side of the hill, Floyd had vanished in the thin air. Join us this week as we investigate the disappearance of Floyd Roberts. Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument is slightly larger than Glacier National Park at 1,048,000 acres. That is so big. Yeah, and this is so big. This isn't even Grand Canyon National Park. This is yeah. just one of the wilderness areas like around it. Like a chunk of it. <laughs> which is the size of another very popular park, yes. Glacier. That's huge. It's yeah. a very remote, undeveloped area, uh, jointly managed by the National Park Service and BLM, uh, Bureau of Land Management, lo- located in the northern edge of the Grand Canyon. Uh, there are no paved roads in this area, so this is very backcountry. Yeah. You're not going here unless you either know the area or looking for adventure, really. It's incredibly rugged. So I've I've seen the Grand Canyon, but I've never hiked it. And the Grand Canyon among hikers is generally known as a harder place to hike. Mm-hmm. So 
up that a notch with this wilderness area. Yeah, not even being in a heavily regulated portion of the park. Yeah, you've got none of the services that you'd expect in the national park. It's it's very wild and untamed, which a lot of people love. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, I mean that's that's what we kind of prefer to get away from the people and become one with the land. Yeah. So backcountry permits are still required, though, unlike some BLM land. Well, no. I, so my apologies. For overnight. This is for Grand Canyon National Park. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought this was for the other part. So no. up in this area, as I say, BLM, typically you can kind of just Pretty go. Because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's so vast and big and there's not really tons of traffic. So you're not really damaging stuff. Yep. So for Grand Canyon, you do need that stuff. There's lots of other activities. This is the north area where there's not much going on. Yeah. Uh, this part is located in Arizona. Uh, it was established in January 11th of 2000. So relatively new, 21 years old. Yep. Uh, it only sees about 80, 88,000 visitors per year, which is low compared to what you see at other major areas of the park. I'm sure yeah. Grand Canyon Park is in the millions. Oh, yeah. Because it's so popular. Yep. Uh, since it is located in the northern edge of the Grand Canyon, uh, the following facts that we're going to go over are statistics that relate to Grand Canyon National Park. So it is north of there. Uh, so we're not talking specifically about this area because it simply isn't monitored that closely. Yeah. And I, when I, you know, doing the research, I tried to differentiate between when we were talking about the actual monument area versus the national park. So, okay. Um, so this is, this is cool. Uh, it, this is in the monument. A yeah. 2005 expedition to examine 24 caves in the park had produced two new species of millipede, the first bark loose discovered in North America, and a whole new genus of cricket and four new cricket species, which is like really exciting for yeah. people who are into insects. Yes. <laughs> I hate bugs, so I'm not going to say I don't care, but I just don't like bugs. So, yeah. So that's not, not up my alley. Not a big fan either. <clears throat> Uh, a rim to rim hike of the Grand Canyon is one of the longest hikes there. It's 44 miles round trip, which usually takes approximately five to seven days to complete. It's about the distance I did in Kilimanjaro. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, there's a lot of really cool hikes. I would love to do. I've always wanted to do a horseback trip in Grand Canyon. You know what I want to do there? Um, or you go down and this is like total glamping style hike yeah. <laughs> you do the rafting stuff oh yeah and you raft along camp and then you keep rafting and camp right on the shore so you can like swim and we stuff we talked like that. about doing that almost every year and we never do yeah we should probably just we should just we do should, it we we're just, getting older now you know yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> we, this backcountry stuff's getting you know, it's, it's getting harder to do yeah <laughs> life gets in the way so according to the Copen climate classification system second episode we've mentioned them yes yep <laughs> Copen with an umlaut because i know what that is <laughs> The Grand Canyon National Park has five climate zones, cold, semi-arid, humid, continental, dry, cool summer, humid, continental, dry, warm summer, <laughs> warm summer Mediterranean, and hot summer Mediterranean. That's hot hiker summer. They yeah. should make a song for that. Hot hiker summer. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. On average, the hottest months are June through August with average highs around 82 to 85, which is actually not too bad. I would have thought it would have been a lot hotter. Mm-hmm. The coldest months are typically November through April with average lows ranging from 29 degrees to 18. Record highs coming at 101 in June and negative 20 in December and February. Huge range of temperatures in this yeah. park. And even, Joel will get into a uh, little bit more of the weather, but even in the hottest months of the summer, it can still get cold. Yeah, that's great. Night. Well, it's a desert setting. And that's yeah. what it says. So when it gets, it can get very cold at night because it's desert, uh, even in June and July. Uh, lows routinely dip between the 40s and 50s. So that's where you can get into potential, uh, well, I'm, I'm blanking on the word. Hypothermia. Hypothermia. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Holy cow. <laughs> uh, on average, Grand Canyon National Park gets about 15.3 inches of rain with June as the driest month and July and August as the wettest months. To put this in perspective, LA gets about 15 inches of rain per year while you, New York City gets almost 46 inches of rain per year. So, so it's dry. It's very dry. Yeah. Uh, GCNP also <laughs> gets Grand about, Canyon yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, we, you decided to sh- shorten I did. this part. Uh, they get about 43 inches of snow per year that I didn't know. Yeah. I did not know it snowed there. I it would does. have never guessed that. Just, I've only flown over it when I'm going to Arizona or mm-hmm. California and it just seems like the rest of the desert. I've only seen it in the summer, so no snow, but yeah, yeah. It, it gets a, you know, some Decent snowfall. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. So uh, the National Park encompasses 277 miles of the Colorado River and the adjacent uplands. In spots, the Grand Canyon is up to a mile deep and over 18 miles wide. That's crazy. It's big. That's that's huge. Yeah. 
Yeah, I get. We gotta go. I know. I, I, we gotta stop saying we gotta go and just actually go. It's like one of the. It's one of the natural wonders of the world. Yeah, and we haven't hiked it yet. Well, it's a mile deep. Yeah, it's like that's really, like a mile. That's like <laughs> really. It's like really deep. <laughs> but even like eighteen miles across, that's yeah. insane too. So layered bands of colorful rock, some dating back to the Precambrian times, which is 541 million to 4.6 billion years ago, can be seen throughout the Grand Canyon. So that's what's cool about the depth is like yeah. you can literally see the different levels. Like you'd normally have to dig that out, but the water did it for us. And for those of you who know your geology and science, 4.6 billion is a, roughly the age of the planet. So you can see some of the oldest rocks on the planet yeah, it formed park. when the whole planet was a volcanic yeah, you know, wasteland, just, basically. Hellhold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the canyon itself was created by an incision of the Colorado River and the tributaries after the Colorado Plateau was uplifted, causing the Colorado River system to develop along its present path. So that little river at the bottom carved that thing over hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, if not billions of it years. It really is amazing when you go and see the Grand Canyon and how vast and huge it is. And then the tiny little river is in the bottom and like yeah. how long it took to cut through that rock. Yes. <laughs> well, and you think about like where all that sediment eventually went. Yeah. Like all over, went into the ocean, then over those billions of years moved around or all that stuff. So yeah. it's, it's really cool. Uh, in the monument, elevations range from the lows of 1,200 feet above sea level uh, at Grand Walsh Bay at Lake Mead to the peak of 8,000 feet at Mount Turnbull. So nothing too crazy as far as altitude goes. Yep. Uh, just more like the aridness of the area, I think, yeah. is probably what's the worst. Exposure and aridness. Yeah. Uh, in Grand Canyon National Park, elevations range from 1,200 feet at the Colorado River to 9,100 feet to the North Rim entrance. So the types of dangers that are present here. There's over 90 species of mammals 450 species of birds, eight species of amphibian, 41 species of reptiles, and some of those animals include bighorn sheep, bison, elk, mule deer, uh, mountain lions. Those obviously are ones that can pose a risk to people hiking alone. Uh, California condor, uh, gila monster. What's a gila monster? It looks like a big fat like lizard. Have you ever seen them? <clears throat> They're like I haven't because that's why I asked you what it was. <laughs> I, I guess that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean they uh, they have real stubby legs. They're real like th like thick, and they have like a their tongue looks like a snake's tongue. It comes out all the time like a snake. Oh, what are those big ones that are in like Japan? Komodo dragons. Yeah, is it, it's like a small version of that. Kind of. Yeah, they kind yeah. of are similar. That would have been easier to describe. You said it kind of looks like a baby komodo dragon. Yeah, I guess a I fat baby komodo dragon <laughs> instead of uh, the all the stuff you just did. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> we we have rattlesnakes. Those obviously can be an issue. Uh, it's also a variety to a bunch of scorpions, uh, which some are venomous and so, tarantulas. Yeah, so there's there's some stuff that can get you. And what's crazy, I've always known because I've been stung by a scorpion before, and it's not fun. It's like yeah. a really bad bee sting. But the bigger the scorpion, the better. Really? Yes. The smaller they are, the more venomous they are. Huh. Uh, that That's one thing I learned when uh, I got bit, freaked out, and called poison control. And they're like, <laughs> your tongue turns purple, call 911. I was right. like, yeah, I definitely won't wait if, yeah. if that happens. Um, so, yeah, they're, uh, those are all very common. You know, if you're alone, again, you can have health problems. If you get stung, bitten, whatever, um, you got to watch out for that. Right. Rattlesnake bite is going to be more of a concern, but even a yeah, snake bite. Yeah, clotting the blood. Yeah, mm -hmm. even sometimes when you get bit by a snake, it doesn't inject the venom. So, but you yeah. should just... You still don't want to. It's easy <laughs> to avoid a snake bite for the most part by just, if you see a snake, don't you know mess around with it and just kind of keep an eye on like where you're walking. It's easy to avoid a snake bite by not going near snakes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the exposures, uh, heat in the warm months, uh, just like every other park, if you're not bringing water, especially with the dryness, yeah. uh, you're going to lose water faster. You're going to sweat, but in the areas that are dry, it almost like sucks it out of you. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you know that from Canyon lands, like you lose water way faster in a dry climate versus a humid one. Yep. Um, so you have that uh, direct exposure to sunlight. So if you're not wearing appropriate clothing, things like that. Yeah. Uh, and just as we say, you never want to wait till you're thirsty when you're filling up. You always want to stay hydrated. Yeah. And an interesting <clears throat> thing too is I read the human body can really only absorb about a liter of water an hour. So if you're already dehydrated, your dehydration could maybe run away from the ability of your body to absorb water. So it's always important to just kind of keep sipping water throughout your hike. Well, and preload. Drink yeah. tons of water before you even go. 
Yeah, and the Park Service recommends uh, at least carrying four liters of water per day if you're hiking in the summer months in Grand Canyon. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously cold at night, so if you don't have the proper gear for overnight, you can uh, go into hypothermia, now that it, Mike reminded me of the word. Yeah. Uh, lightning can be an issue, too. With no trees or, or very exposed terrain, uh, you are the tallest spot a lot of times. So yep. if you're in, caught in a lightning storm, that can be very dangerous. Uh, the possibility of flash floods, even though there is very little rain, the soil there is not made to absorb it. So if a lot of rain starts hitting, even somewhere where you're not, you can be swept away in the flash floods. Those can be very, very dangerous. Yeah. So difficulty in general, uh, majority of the Grand Canyon hikers are here for the first time. And some may be avid hikers, but aren't used to the type of climate uh, that they're in is kind of like a desert climate. If you're mm -hmm. not used to that, if you normally go to more, you know, greenery, natural parks, things like that, it's it's a completely different thing. Yeah. So just being prepared, uh, food, water, understanding what you're doing, you know, giving your itinerary is the way you're going to survive in this type of park. Yeah. Um, outside of that, what do you what do you think biggest risks are? Exposure. Uh, absolutely. I think dehydration is the number one risk. I think people don't people know they need water for when they're hiking, but I don't think people think they don't think about how much water they're going to sweat out, especially if they're exerting themselves, you know, all day with a heavy pack on. Um, and if you've exposed skin, sun on the skin makes it like, I think people think sometimes like, Oh, if I wear pants and long sleeve shirt, I'm going to sweat more. Yeah. And the reality is the sun's going to be drying you out. So it's not that you're sweating less. It's you're not feeling it. Yeah, it's and me the drying. sweat cools your body off. Yeah, it's me drying you out. And then even if you are, you know, hydrated, you're going to be just destroyed by sunburn. So, you know, even if you're safe, like you're going to be uncomfortable. Uh, there's nothing more uncomfortable than hiking in 100 degree heat with sunburn. So, you know, always when you're hiking in, you know, desert climates like Grand Canyon, you know, wear long sleeved clothing. Yeah. Um, and you don't hike during the heat of the day. Personally, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even hike Grand Canyon during the summer. I would. Yeah. I would probably not go any earlier Spring than and fall. September. Yeah, yeah. non-rain months. It may be like May. Um, you well, know, even just desert conditions. Look at any culture that is a desert culture. Yeah. How are they dressed? They dr They look like they're uncomfortable because they're covered in like. They're just covered. Their skin's covered. Yeah. They know what they're doing. They live in it. I mean, I always, I always <laughs> mimic like, them. Yeah. Look at cowboy movies. They're not riding around in yeah, t-shirts anybody and in the middle east like <laughs> anybody in the middle east that live in desert all the time yeah. they're covered because you do not want exposed skin so. absolutely so yeah i think i think dehydration is um your top concern i think uh because it's so vast i think real interesting story joe didn't touch on it here but uh i won't get into it uh too in depth, but there's a lot of hazards in Grand Canyon and it's so vast. A lot of people think they can just go stomping around off trail doing what they want. Well, there's a story about this guy. Um, I think this happened back in 2009. He was a 20 year old student, a very fit guy, hiked a lot and he went kind of off trail and he went kind of, uh, you know, he was kind of hopping down cliffs to get down to the Colorado and he had, he had no like actual path that he was going. He was just kind of you know, oh, there's a cliff I can jump down on. along wherever he wanted to. And he he jumped down onto a cliff ledge, and he got down there, and then he realized, oh, crap, uh, I can't go any further down. It's too far of a, a drop. And then he realized he can't get back up from where he jumped down because he didn't have any climbing gear on him, and he ended up dying of dehydration on that cliff, and it was something like he was only less than a mile away from the river. So, like, he could almost see water, but he couldn't get off that cliff ledge because, you know, that, I mean, there's a reason yeah. why they put trails in the park to keep, it's to keep you safe. Yeah. And there's a lot of wildlife they don't want you trampling on. And that's why I never go hiking alone. <laughs> yeah. And you don't, you don't go hiking alone. And, um, you know, if I was hiking in somewhere like this monument, I would definitely have a, you know, personal locator beacon or a satellite phone with me in yeah. case something went wrong. Well, to me, that's not hiking alone. If you have something that can contact yeah. externally, like that's hiking with backup. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get into Floyd Roberts. So Floyd went missing on the 17th of June. Is that June? June, yeah. June 17th, which was a Friday. I uh, was reported missing on the next day, Saturday. Uh, Floyd was a male, age 52. Uh, he was 5'11", 170 pounds, so average size guy. Yep. Um, based on the weight, pretty fit. Yeah. You know, not overweight. Uh, hair was graying brown hair, brown eyes. 
Uh, the clothes he was last seen in was a red long sleeve shirt, blue jeans, multicolored mesh Nike free uh, Nike free sneakers, sunglasses with white frames and orange lenses, and a large blue low alpine contour backpack. He brought two gallons of water with him and enough food to last a week. So Roberts has uh, his two inch scar above his upper rear hamstring and a small mole next to his right nostril. So we know exactly what he looks like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he lived in Huntsville, Alabama and worked for NASA. Uh, eventually moved to Treasure Island, Florida, where he taught computer programming and game design at Middleton High School. So I already like him because he's a smart guy. At, yeah. He worked at NASA and is a computer programmer. So that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Floyd had been hiking with his best friend, Ned Bryant, in the area around Grand Canyon on almost a yearly basis since 1992. So he was very familiar with the area. He seemed to be geared appropriately. Yep. Seemed like he knew what he was doing. Yeah. So Ned Bryant and his wife were board members of the Grand Canyon Hikers and Backpackers Association. I bet you can't be a board member if you don't know anything about the area. Yeah, I think it's safe to say his friend, Ned Bryant, is probably a very experienced uh, backpacker and hiker yeah. as well. While Roberts hasn't been hiking for a few years, friends and family said he was a very experienced backcountry hiker and had hiked this area, uh, this very area in 2011 without incident. So yeah, not only is he an experienced hiker, but he's actually literally hiked the same route just a few years before he went missing. So he knew the area. I mean, how many hikes have we done twice? Probably. Oh yeah. Very, I, even very I, we, I did the exact same thing, the exact same route in Glacier. And That's probably the only place you've hiked twice. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, it's unusual for most people to, unless they live by that park. Yeah, to hike if it. we live close to a place, I'm sure we do it multiple times. But even then, you try and do something new. Yeah. So, you're not doing the same thing. So, I mean, it, it, very rarely in our cases that we cover, the people are this familiar with the area. So, it uh, just makes the disappearance more unusual. Yep. All right. So, why don't you get us into the timeline? Yeah, so the timeline is a little shorter uh, compared to some of the cases we do, but like Joe said, it starts off on June 17th of 2016 into Friday. So Floyd Roberts, his best friend Ned Bryant, and Bryant's daughter Madeline, uh, Madeline, uh, sorry, who I believe was 12, uh, plan to set out on a nine-day hike of the Monument area. So they plan to hike on the, I believe it's called the Shivwitz Plateau, and eventually exit the canyon via Separation Canyon. And this is according... Here, I can help you, Mike. <laughs> okay. Madeline. Madeline. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, go on. Sorry. Um, this was according to the uh, MPS report. And so now this plateau is an extensive plateau that pretty much covers the entire area of the case we're talking about today. Um, so they plan to do this hike for about nine days, uh, the group headed towards the extreme western portion of the Grand Canyon and an area that Joe mentioned earlier called Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument, and specifically near Trail Canyon um, and 214 Mile Canyon, which is around the Shanley Spring area. Um, so the uh, group planned to spend the first couple of days camped alongside the river, and they anticipated that they would emerge back into civilization around June 26th. So now, this is the part of the story that where things start not making sense to me. Um, same day, 4.45 p.m., uh, just before the group was going to reach their main trailhead to start their hike, they came upon a, you know, a small hill. Uh, one of the posts by Ned Bryant said that this was not like a hill that you would um, you take half a day to hike. It was like a real small, just like a quick over and you're done. And for whatever reason, I always hate when people split up, Yeah. but Ned Bryant and his daughter want, decided to go up over the hill while Roberts decided to go around the hill. And uh, like I said, Ned described it as a, just a small hill, nothing, you know, something that would take maybe 30 minutes to go over. Mm -hmm. um, he also mentioned that going around the hill uh, took about the same time, but there was like thick brush that Roberts would have had to go through. Um Conditions during um, on the this day were, I think they said around 92 degrees Fahrenheit with temps rising to 110. So in the next few days, so it was very hot. Um, they're hiking in June. Like I said, I don't know that I would. Uh, if I'm only hiking Grand Canyon once in my life, probably not going to do it in June. Yeah, where it's going to be miserable. I'm going to do it in you know where it's a little cooler out yeah, during fall. the day. Yeah, and um, you know. They're still kind of hiking during the mid heat of the day, 
like I know when we were in Canyonlands, we would take a break kind of from about 1130 to about two or three. Yep. And try to find some shade because that's the hottest part of the day to hike in. And if you can conserve your energy and, you know, your water, you can make, you can cover more ground when it's cooler out and closer to dark. So again, I, I don't get some of the decisions they made. Um, so when Ned and his daughter reached the other side of the hill, there was no sign of Roberts. So, uh, they immediately started looking for him. They retraced their steps, uh, all the way back to the road. Uh, no sign of him. This one, and this is shocking. Uh, 30 minutes. That's it. That's the amount of time they were separated. Yeah. That's wild. I, I mean, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll get through the timeline a little more. Did, I, it, did it have the name of the trailhead that they were going or the name of the trail? Um, did I miss that? I think they were hiking near Trail Canyon slash 214 Mile Canyon. Okay. They were near the Shanley Spring area. And he was last seen. I've got a picture in here, Joe. He was last seen at Kelly Tanks, which is a lake. Okay. Um, so. But, yeah. So he was just, he just vanished. 30 minutes. And um, so, you know, they retraced their steps. I'm sure they, they kind of scoured that hill area. And when they found no sign of him, him and his daughter decided to camp there for the night, hoping that Roberts had just gotten lost and he'd wander his way back in the camp. They even laid their sleeping bags out in trees to try to make it easier for uh, Roberts to see where they were camping if he ended up walking walking by. So um, now it's the morning of June 18th of 2016. Um, Ned and his daughter wake up, still no sign of Roberts. Ned and his daughter then have to hike back out to try and get to cell phone service. So they they didn't get to cell phone service until 3 p.m. that day, which uh, in my research of um, Grand Canyon and from being in Canyonlands, these areas rarely have cell reception. Now, that's not to say don't bring your phone, but you're not going to get cell phone reception in the the vast majority of Grand Canyon yeah, or any of these big Western parks. Um, so it's June 18th, 2016, 3 PM. Ned uh, reports Roberts missing to the national park service. Uh, Ned uh, reports to the park service that um, he was last equipped with two, uh, two gallons of water, a week's worth of food and a map created by Ned Bryant to uh, with their planned route on it. So this is, Sorry, I had my mic off because I was clearing my throat. But <laughs> this is like one of those cases where the guy who's missing is actually in a really good spot as far as like, okay, if he's lost, can't find people, he's got all this stuff. Yeah. He can survive for a week normally. Yeah. And then arguably, if he can have access to water, they're close to a river, you know, another week without food if he's getting water regularly. So at, at worst case scenario, what, a week and three days? Yeah, and they said, uh, you know, family made comments that, Unless he Ned, unless Roberts was severely injured, he would have had the smarts to find water. Sure, and um, so they just couldn't contemplate that. Did, did they mention? He said he, they had a map, or did? So it sounds like he uh, uh, Roberts had a handmade map that Ned made, which uh, I he, I. I I don't. I don't know. Like he handmade it. Like, we always get it. the National Geographic like waterproof, waterproof maps. maps. Yeah. Like that's what we always have. That that's, yeah. That's what I'd. Write. It's what like ten dollars. Yeah, you can get them on Amazon. Yeah, and I collect them every time I go to a new place. Like, yeah. I, I, it's cool to keep the pack, whatever. But, so uh, you okay. know, whatever he whatever. made a map. I mean, maybe copy and pasted maps from the internet sure. and printed them out. But so they they were convinced that he would have had the smarts to find water if he had gotten lost, and uh, so that's another kind of puzzling. Uh, part of this, and there were no signs that Roberts was experiencing dehydration before they hit that hill. So, from all accounts that I was able to find, there was no indication that anything was going wrong with Roberts before that hill. He well, and they said he he brought two gallons. Was it two gallons of water? How, yeah. many, how many liters is that? I don't know. <laughs> I have the internet. Hold on. Um. So yeah, uh, I'm still on Imperial. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, he went missing around 4.45 to, let's say, 5.15 p.m. on the 17th, and he wasn't reported, he wasn't actually reported missing until 3 p.m. on the 18th, so roughly about 24 hours, um, 
we've always said this in the past, you know, those first 48 hours are the most important in a missing person case, you know, out in the wilderness, probably, uh, you know, having so much water with him and seven and a half liters. So that's a lot of water for one, for, for a single guy. Um, for, I, I'm sure they expected to find water, but he, he overpacked water arguably, unless they, for whatever reason, their path wasn't going to take them near the river. But, but well, they even said their their plan was to stick by the river for the first yeah. That's few what I say. So he he had enough water, more than enough water. Seven gal or seven liters, of, seven and a half liters of water is almost double what the National Park Service recommends. Yeah, that's a lot of water. I mean, that's great. He should have that should have been more than enough water to survive twenty four hours. Oh yeah, in there. And he had a week's worth. You, of food. you can stretch that. I mean, that's like if you know you're lost and you're yeah. starting to really, you get good shade and cover. You can stretch that water up for a long time. Yeah. So th- it's just another thing that doesn't make sense about this case. Um, so the search and rescue mission uh, really kicks off on the 19th. Obviously, Ned and his daughter did some very limited searching around that hill and didn't find him. Um, but the you know the SAR op- operation really kicked off on the 19th, which would have been a Sunday, I believe. And initially, only about 15 people were involved in the search, but that quickly escalated as the days went on. So according to an M- MPS press release on the 24th, um, the SAR operation grew to include ground teams from Grand Canyon National Park, Grand Canyon uh, Parashant National Monument, Mojave County, uh, Cochino County uh, Search and Rescue, and aerial support from the... Mesa Verde Hell Attack crew and aircraft uh, team. So they had a pretty good contingent of people on the ground. I read some other reports that um, they had some sniffer dogs. They called them sniffer dogs. So I'm just guessing they're just regular tracking regular, dogs. Tracking dogs. Um, so they had dogs out there searching for them. Uh, in all, they searched about a 10 mile square area um, okay. of this very remote wilderness. And the MPS made an app and a note about how extreme, like extremely remote this part of uh, the Grand Canyon was that it took searchers several hours just to get into the search area every day when they were bringing people in, which really created problems with, um, you know, rescue operations and communications. So, well, and just keeping the searchers safe too. Yeah. So obviously they set up base camp at, and around Kelly tanks, which like I said, was a lake kind of near where he was last seen. And, um, they searched for about six days and they found absolutely nothing. They didn't find any gear. At one point they thought they found some tracks, but those turned out to be not his. And they, it's, it's literally like he just vanished into thin air. There was no weather that it was just hot and sunny so like no rain, no washout, no, rain. no nothing. I mean, there might have been wind or something, but um, <clears throat> there should have been. I, you know, when we hiked in Canyonlands, a lot of the hike was kind of on sandy surfaces, and mm-hmm. we left clear footprints, sure. like our group did. And yeah, that's a good point. That he went that other way. It's not heavily trafficked, so you should have been e- easily able to track him. Well, it was thick brush too, like. So what? you'd see stomping it down or you'd see or, broken branches. Yeah. When I've hiked, when I've been up North in the North woods, when you go off off trail into like the thick, like your body breaks a lot of the branches and it, you know, for a trained tracker, I think they, they would be able to notice that. So absolutely no trace of him was ever found. No gear, you know, shoes, not his backpack. Where does backpack go? Like, uh, and there was no indication that around that hill there was any big obstacles or crevasses or anything where he could have fallen into. It wasn't like they're hiking on the edge of a canyon, at least from the the research I did. Yeah, I'm looking at Google Earth right now and like it's not there's nothing like aggressive. Yeah. Like where oh you can slip and fall, you know, nineteen hundred feet to your death. Yeah. yeah. So you know, that doesn't make any any sense to me. And so, you know, the, the search went for six days. And this is a, a statement by the National Park Service when they concluded the search. Uh, they wrote, with no additional clues to guide search efforts, the search will be scaled back to a continuous but limited mode in which rangers and pilots will continue to search for clues within the area. 
In addition, flyers with Robert's picture and description remain posted at various South Rim locations and in the search area at Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument. So this is in line with a lot of other searches. Once the main search ends, um, you'll see a lot of very scaled back search. Sometimes the, the rangers will do training in these areas to uh, you know, help train rangers. On Honestly, how to search. I can't even see they've been training out there if it takes hours for them to just get to the area. Yeah, that's the thing. Like I think in normal national parks, like if you're in Rocky Mountain National Park or Glacier, that might be more true. I doubt I mean, how are they going to, you know, go five hours out in the middle of nowhere to train? Maybe because yeah, there's yeah. someone went missing there, but yeah. Um, so that is kind of the, uh, to have a, you know, Thanksgiving twist with the meat and potatoes <laughs> of the timeline. God, that was so lame. That was bad. That was lame. <laughs> you are becoming a dad. Oh gosh. Speaking um, of, did you know that towels are the leading cause of dry skin? <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. Um, I'm going to have to start loading you up with these. I have about 14 years of experience with children. I got to give you, you all do. the dad jokes. <laughs> um, so uh, these are some of the questions I have about this case. I kind of like to do this at the end of a timeline, just things I'm thinking about that don't make sense. Um, so, you know, first, if they're experienced, why are they hiking Grand Canyon in June? Something I wouldn't do. Um why are, why were they hiking during kind of peak sun that day? If it, you know, if it's in the 90s. Yeah, it that, seemed like they plan to reach the trailhead at like a bad time. Yeah, that, I mean, I don't know. I know in these remote areas, like this is just like, it sounds just like Canyonlands in the sense that there's no paved roads. And when we started our hike in Canyonlands, you know, we parked the car and we walked on a road for like half a day before we got to the trailhead. So um, that that doesn't, seem too surprising but um why did they split up when they got to this hill that that's my number one gripe in all of these cases when people split from their group like i always an advocate of you know stay if you're with the four people stay together if something happens it's a lot easier to deal with if there's four people than just yourself yeah um you know if the hike over the small hill was only 30 minutes the hike around was reported to be even shorter. Uh, why didn't searchers find his body or any of his gear around the side of the hill? How that, did it, that's what's crazy to me? Yeah, what happened? Like, I mean, he's a hundred and seventy pound guy. He had a backpack on full, you know, weeks worth of food. Set, you know, two gallons of water. That's a lot. And there's of like one path. Like this is the, our second case where it's like a thirty <laughs> yeah. minute window where there's only one place you could yeah. go in such a short time, and they're just gone. Gone. Uh, so, but even the other one, it was, uh, I forget what mountain it was, but it was like snow and stuff. Like, okay. I could like, maybe I covered snow and crevasse. Like this one is even crazier Yeah, because it's just desert. Yeah. You can see everything. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there was no reported weather other than heat during the search. Uh, how are they not able to pick up any kind of tracks around the area where he went missing? So, uh, I obviously have not hiked this part of Grand Canyon, but from my experience in desert hikes, uh, you leave tra tracks. I mean, it's pretty common to, you know, when you walk through somewhere, you're going to leave footprints. I just don't understand how, especially if they had tracking dogs in there and there was no rain, how they didn't pick up anything, any kind of scent or um, any kind of footprints. I mean, you got to think about how, e like, they know exactly where he went. Like, two of them went up the hill and he went around it. Like, it should be yeah. a pretty easy, like, all right, let's start here. He went, I mean, it, it. And he specifically stated that it wasn't like a big hill. Yeah, like 30 he, minutes he, to get over it. Yeah, he, he specifically said, like, hey, it was a tiny hill. Yeah, so I, like, as. So he went around because he didn't want to go up it. That's what it sounds probably, like. He wanted yeah. to go around. It's not an incline. Yeah. Which, okay. But, like, still don't separate. I know. But, yeah, so that just kind of is puzzling to me. So those are just some of the questions. Um I had about it. Uh, I did make a note that these, this case has a very familiar tone to it with a lot of other missing persons cases in the sense that they disappear while separated. Um, bad weather, in this case, you know, extreme heat. A body is never found um, missing in rocky, rocky uh, areas or boulder fields. 
uh, the person is either high, the missing person is either highly intellectual or accomplished or has or has some sort of disability and went missing in an area where other people have gone missing. So I didn't mention any of the cases, but there have been several other disappearances in this exact area of where Roberts went missing. So, um, you know, I'm just giving a little red meat to some of the listeners that like some of the more, you know, paranormal side yeah. of disappearances. Yeah. I honestly, the only thing I can think of is, um, and I guess we'll get into theories now that I'm kind of thinking about theories. Yeah, is, just get into it. Yeah, is that maybe he was a little more dehydrated than he than letting on, and even though he had a lot of water with him, that he just wasn't drinking enough water. I mean, that is possible when you're hiking, um, especially at elevation. I don't always remember to drink water. You, you, for some reason, I don't always feel as thirsty. Or hungry. Or hungry, yeah. Both those things. Like, I, I especially in high altitude, I always have to force myself to eat. Yeah. Otherwise, so, I'll do, like, 200 calories for the whole day, and, like, you feel fine. Yeah, so maybe he was, um, he was a little more dehydrated than we thought, and confusion was setting in, which caused him to get lost or perhaps when he went around um he went around the hill because they he, ned did mention there was a lot of thick brush on the side of the, the hill that they went around and maybe he got turned around in there and walked the wrong direction but you could see the hill yeah. like just if go you're going to the, around go it, to the peak <laughs> just yeah maybe go back up it or just kind of you know, shadow the base of the hill until you get to the other side. Yeah. And if he's an experienced hiker and he, he sounds like a pretty intelligent guy, he worked at NASA as a computer programmer, you think he would, you know, put that two and two together. Yeah. And he and it's not like it was his first time out in the wilderness. No, he hiked like, this exact location yeah, he, before. He hiked the exact location. <laughs> yeah. They said he wasn't as experienced as the other two in the area, but yeah. if if you've got the gear, you're a hiker in general. Yeah. You can kind of make good judgment calls. Yeah. Um, so some friends and family, um, like I mentioned earlier in the episode, uh, friends and family think that something, some type of serious injury happened. Otherwise he would have known to make it towards water. Uh, they mentioned that he was not a suicidal person. No, none of his family suspected suicide or I didn't want, even think about that, but okay. Yeah. Or wanting to like disappear on his own. Like sure. the family actually mentioned that and they said that's absolutely not plausible. And based on everything I read about Floyd, it does not seem. Yeah. There's no indicators that that no. was a potential thing. Um, a lot of locals obviously blame the heat. Uh, one local that I, a statement I found from them said that the week Roberts went missing, heat, heat re, uh, related incidents killed four other hikers in one day. So. I think that's extremely relevant. Yeah. So I think that's rare that you're hearing like that many people lost in one day. Yeah. Especially in a day. Yeah. And you know, that's a, that's a common theme with Grand Canyon. It's very, uh, it can get very hot and people I think underestimate how much water they need. So see, but that, that to me is like, I would lean 90% towards that happening, but then where is he? And he had seven and a half liters of water with him. (laughs) Yeah. But it's a lot of water. Even then you can like, like I have like, you know, like there's some people that are more susceptible to like heat stroke. Yeah. So like I have a son that even when he's playing sports outside in summer, he'll be drinking water like crazy. He still gets really flush. Like he looks yeah. like he's going to have heat stroke and we make sure he drinks ahead of time. So like, okay, let's, let's pretend he's more susceptible to it and he succumbed to heat stroke. And then obviously it just deteriorates longer and longer. The more yeah. he's not getting help. Where is his stuff? Where's his body? Where is that? That's, that's kind of like the, what gets me is I think, it's easily explained what could have happened to him. Yeah. Tripped and fell, had an injury where he couldn't move and then succumbed to the elements as a result. Yeah. Where's the body? Where's his gear? Yeah. Um, yeah. A I mean, week's if, worth of stuff is not a small. No. And I mean, if he would have had a heat stroke and collapsed, you know, around that hill, they would have found him. I yeah. Mean, like even in the bush area. Yeah. It's not like there's a, like, Hey, this is where he was. I'm sure that area searched really heavily. Yeah. Because that was his last seen point that they're going to, they and probably they brought the dogs in. Yeah, that was probably where they did their most extensive searching was around that hill area, Kelly Tank area. Yeah. And well, you would, just think of the dogs. They picked up the scent. There wasn't rain. There wasn't thing that would. Uh, we talked no. to the guy, the searcher said they'll, sh- you know, you shed your skin. Yeah. And the only shed thing that your will, clothing. Well, you, well, your, your skin cells, all the stuff oh, like that yeah, like yeah. before it gets a scent. And they said the only thing that will ruin that is major weather events or things or time. Yeah. 
and you're a dry, arid place where things get like mummified because they don't change that often. Yeah. Like how come the dogs couldn't pick up his scent? Yeah. There's not a lot of people traveling there. They're the only people in that area, arguably. Yeah. Like where did he go? Yeah. So, um, you know, some have said he may, maybe Feller uh, climbed into a crevice to escape uh, the heat due to confusion. So that goes back to my point that maybe he was, ha- he had more dehydration than he was letting on to. And then it just like hit him all at once when he separated and he got confused and started making poor decisions. Maybe he walked out of the search area. I, I think that the first half of that is the most reasonable thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, th- that was one of the theories some people had was that he, he was confused be- due to heat exhaustion or dehydration, wandered out of the search area. And then other people said maybe he was crushed under a rock fall. But again, if you're a searcher and you see a fresh rock fall out in the woods... And yeah, you're you might want to go check it person, out. You're yeah. probably going to check that out. Yeah. So, um, you know, and finally there are mountain lions um, and he was hiking by himself. But again, if you've been attacked by a mountain lion, you would see evidence of that on the ground and dogs would cue I, in on I that think, right away. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, none of this really makes sense. People that when I was doing research for this case, locals from that area were just like, not just like, oh yeah, it was heat. It was heat. Yeah. Like, but I, again, like I understand the vastness of that area, but I feel like if he would have just collapsed from heat stroke, they would have found his gear or his body. Um, I mean, I, I'm leaning towards the most plausible theory in my head is that he got confused and wandered out of the search area and is still somewhere in the monument, and they just didn't find him because they only searched a 10-square-mile radius and he was a pretty fit dude. He had a lot of water and food with him. He could have probably covered 10 miles in 24 hours before the search really started. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. So, uh, th- I mean, that's the only thing that really makes sense to me. Um, I don't know. What are you thinking? I don't think he left the search area. I was tuning into when you said he might have crawled in like a crevasse or something. To so escape the heat. Yeah, and I wonder if he fell in like a small cave or like and an aquifer or something, still there. and you know, or like if like fell injured, yeah, and ran out of gear, ran out of supplies eventually. Do and all kind of stemming from some confusion from dehydration, potentially. Yeah. And I'm looking at it more like uh, just thinking about like the facts of the episode they talked about. They just explored like 24 different caves. Yeah, and that goes along with kind of the cave map of where you see a lot of these people going missing. It seems to always happen to be along this cave map too. So yeah. like when you go off major trails, could you step in an area that's thin and you fall through or you climb into somewhere and you go too deep? I was thinking about that guy who said like just hop down on a plateau ledge. Yeah. And then and couldn't could, climb back out or get, and he was, further, and yeah. he was, he was out in the open. Like imagine being inside of a cave, you get down and all of a sudden you can't climb back out. No one yeah. can hear you. Uh, that's to me the most logical is is that I think scenario. I'm jumping on your train with that one. Yeah. I just I just think he wouldn't have hiked that because like I know with hiking, like I'm not gonna just keep going off into the desert if I don't know where I'm gonna go. I'm gonna, no. I, like what I would do is try and make my like area very big. If I have like I usually have like a big blanket, like I'd lay it out so like people could see from the air. Start like, a fire. Yeah, like do things maybe, that are well, gonna draw attention. Dry, maybe not. Yeah, but, well, even then, <laughs> even then, but like we, if you have a sleeping bag in a tent, like yeah. I'm going to lay that tarp out really wide. The tents are usually colorful. They don't look like the terrain. Yeah. So like make my campsite big and noticeable from the sky. Yeah. I would start doing stuff like that naturally. Um, and even like if I need to get shade, guess what? You can put your tent up on those bushes and go underneath it in the shade. Yeah. And then guess what? You have this bright tent and things like that. So I could imagine He worked at NASA. He's a smart guy. Yeah. He could figure stuff out like that. So I'm looking at a scenario where he's not capable of being noticed. Yeah. And to me, that's underground. An accidental fall into something. Yeah. Maybe he was going around the hill and you're supposed to go over. He's like, nope, I'm going to take the easy way so I don't have to climb up. Maybe there was just like some like five foot by five foot opening. Exactly. Like some covered in brush and he stepped on it and went right in. Exactly. That's what I'm like. To me, that's the most logical. But then you would think the searchers who are searching around that hill would find that hole. I yeah. (laughs) I mean, I I agree with you. That's what makes it crazy. It's like to me, that's a logical explanation. Then they search that area heavily. They were right there. It was a 30 minute window. So like that's a very small square footage area 
of where the missing person was. And even Ned and his daughter retraced their steps. And I've got to imagine that they maybe wandered around a little where Roberts walked off and are yelling his name and, you know, screaming for him. Yeah. And you would think if he had fallen in a hole and, you know, didn't die from the fall and was still alive, you would, I mean. So maybe he fell, hit his head, knocked yeah. out. And then just died unconscious, bled out. Like, like you can hit your head, fall like very little, but if you do it just right and have a brain bleed, yeah. Like maybe it was a catastrophic injury in a fall, and it's somewhere that you just don't know. Yeah, that that to me is the most logical. Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, I, and I think unfortunately because this part of Grand Canyon is so lightly visited, um, he may, he may never, you know, his remains may never be discovered. Or if they are, it might be decades from now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's our story on uh, Floyd Roberts. I wanted to do this case just because it reminded the terrain and the weather and everything reminded me a lot of um, my experience in uh, the Maze District of Canyonlands. So um, I don't know, Joe. Do you have anything else to add? Nope. I it's. I think this one's. I don't even want to say clear cut because where is he? But I, I, that's like to me the only thing that could have happened yeah. where you can't find any trace of him. He fell in a hole somewhere. Or the boulder monsters. Or, or they, yeah, where they absorb you into the earth yeah. or whatever. <laughs> that, that's that got to be it. I don't know. That, that's just, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate all of you for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. Have a great Thanksgiving. Yes. Have a great Thanksgiving. And please, you should talk about our show at Thanksgiving. Maybe yes. we can try and solve some of these cases. Maybe even play it while you're having Thanksgiving dinner. Yes. And it's great. at the table. Yeah. Don't talk about <laughs> politics. Put on our show and solve crimes. Yes. That was, that's what you need to do. Uh, and while you're there, tell everyone to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all Rumble. of the socials. We're on, yeah. Rumble. Ooh, we're on Rumble now. Perfect. Yes. We're on Rumble now. Uh, and if you'd like to sh- support us monetarily, you can always go on the Facebook store, our website store, or Patreon to buy swag or sign up. Or just send us envelopes of money. Yeah, envelopes of box. cash. You know, uh, yeah, just, <laughs> just send us envelopes of, of checks. Checks. Because yes, cash can go missing. Yes. Uh, but we do accept briefcases of cash in person. <laughs> um we do accept that in dark alleys yes. with trench coats, so that will be cool. Uh, and just remember when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you all next time. <laughs>